lifelong readers you're in the place to be this is books of pop culture i'm the master curator reggie bailey he's the question god Achilles missouri Achilles, how you feeling feeling good you know i think i think i've gotten to the bottom of what was going on with me uh in our, in our last recording i believe i was just ashy um as i put on some lotion this time uh, and I appear to look like my normal self. I mean, now for viewers, no need to fear. I was equally as handsome as I always am. I mm. just didn't seem to have the same color. Um, but mm. yes, I'm feeling, I say all this to say, I'm feeling edited. Fitting, because I'm mm. feeling, I'm feeling like a first draft. Mm. I'm feeling like a manuscript. I'm feeling unedited. I like that. I like I like the point of view you have acquired there. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I see what you did there and I like it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and I yep. like it. And lifelong readers, the fellowship, whoever you are, I hope you like it too. Because we appreciate you sharing your time with us because you could be anywhere in the world right now, but instead you're kicking it with. BAPC, probably on YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, somewhere along those lines. And at these places, you can do things that we like, such as subscribe to us. You can follow us. You can leave five star reviews unless they have some magic up their sleeve, right, Achille? Yeah, I mean, unless you uh, are feeling frisky and want to do your part to push us into a new stratosphere and you want to give us a zero star review in the attempt to uh, increase the virality of our show, then then we'll accept that. However, if you do not feel like uh, you have the capability of doing that, then we are going to need that five stars, uh, that five star review. We need you to leave the correct review. As as you know, uh, I feel like, Reggie, we have left our imprint on this community. Mm. We've, we've left our imprint on mm -hmm. the bookish landscape. I see mm -hmm. what you did there again. <laughs> so, y'all heard Achilles. If y'all do not have that ability to go viral, y'all do the right thing. Y'all give us five stars. And, of right. course, you got to tell some people that you enjoyed kicking it with BAPC, whether that is a phone call, a text message, a share on your social media platform, a tapping on your neighbor's shoulder, whatever it is, you make sure you tell someone you enjoyed BAPC. And we want you to spend more time with us. So you can do that by going to booksofpopculture.com, joining the fellowship, which is our amazing Patreon community. And you can also subscribe to The Days, which is our incredible newsletter. Killy, we're about to have a. I feel like after this conversation, we'll be a little more polished. Mm. <laughs> I feel I, like we'll be yeah. ready to go to the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I felt like I saw the importance of a conversation like this, but you being the executive uh of this i, I feel like oh, you be in the right place and with the right people you know ah, ah, mm -hmm. ah yeah. that yeah. you you see jb fox show right where brax be like ah, ah that was one of those ah, that was one of those mm -hmm. um today we are speaking with an executive editor at mariner books which is an imprint of harper collins publishers she acquires serious literary and narrative nonfiction and gorgeously written plot-driven novels and short story collections. Big emotions and topical subjects are a plus to her as well. She often works with journalists and thought leaders writing about current events. Public intellectuals and culture critics telling the world about itself. Biographies of legendary figures and some history especially when there are obvious ties to the present day. In all cases, she looks for writers who have something to say. Prior to Mariner Book, she was a senior editor with Beacon Press and held editorial positions at HarperCollins, Viking, which is an imprint at Penguin, and Kensington, in addition to freelancing for six years. 
She also served as an adjunct lecturer for three consecutive spring semesters at the City College of New York, where she taught a weekly course that was called Introduction to Publishing. Come on now. Our guest today is Rakia Clark. Oh, I see what you did there. Ah, okay. All right. ah. okay. And we will be speaking to her about all things editing and publishing after this quick break. Yes, yes. Rakia Clark, what up? executive editor. Hey, it, it, it's, it's nice to see you. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's nice to see both of you. I'm big fans of your work. Y'all are out here doing the work. I love uh, it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That that means a lot coming from you, seriously. Word, and I want to I want to shout you out on air for this because I don't know if people know this. So I, uh, you know, if you've seen the thumbnail for this episode, you saw that one of the books I was holding up was "Punch Me Up to the Gods" uh, by Brian Broom. Shout out to him if he sees this because he was he is a BAPC alum as well. Word. Um, but I appreciate you sending a copy out. Uh, to me, um, you know, because something that book people do that I really like mm -hmm. is they do like handwritten like notes and they just make you feel so important. Like yeah. you're like the most important person in the world. Um, and I, of course, you never disclose what's on the handwritten notes. It ain't nothing crazy. But still, even if it was, you wouldn't know. But anyway, thank you, Rakia, for your um, for your hospitality. And and this came out, what, 2021? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that that is. uh hospitality that tracks back and i thank you for that you're very welcome reggie yes awesome how are you doing genuinely and when we say genuinely if you have trapped gas you can let us know <laughs> if, if it was too hot today where you were you can let us know if if you recently passed gas <laughs> and everything's all well you can let us know so how are you doing genuinely Okay, so genuinely, none of those things are the case for me momentarily. But give me a minute, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm I'm good. I'm genuinely good. Um, the sky is clear in New York City right now. We had the smoke issue last week, so the air feels, you know, as as polluted as normal instead of you know, not normal. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And work is good. Obviously, I'm here in the office. Um. I can't, I really can't complain. I mean, I could, but nobody wants to hear it. That's what and, they say. and no, I, I, I'm, I'm doing quite well. Thank you for asking. Awesome. How are y'all doing? Ah, there it is. <laughs> there it is. We don't get it. We don't get it asked that much, but you've joined some elite company, Rakia. Okay. One question. That's yeah. all it takes. Yeah. Uh, first time, Reggie. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if I have a punny answer right now. Mm. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm good. You know, um, I'm, I'm good. I'll say that because I know that I could be, I guess, not good. So I'm good. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'm doing good. Um, I've been staying up a little bit too late. So perhaps if I had some Columbia coffee. Uh, you know, <laughs> to to perhaps make it through, you know, maybe a a, a Colombian publishing program or Colombia publishing uh, program, you know, maybe I would be better. But I mean, I think I'm doing quite well. Okay, see what you did there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you know, yeah. yeah. Hmm. I like it. You were like, I don't know if I have a punny, you know. And I was like, well, I'm gonna take the ultimate read. I'm gonna. <laughs> I wish I had more arms. That's you know from I mean? logo. That's from the logo for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, but thank you so much for asking. Absolutely. You're welcome. Appreciate it. And Rakia, what is the most important lesson you have learned, not about the business of writing, unless you want to talk about that too, but about the business of publishing or what are some of the most important lessons you've learned about the business of publishing? Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to develop your taste. Uh, very, very important. You need to know what you like. Be honest with yourself about that. What do you really enjoy reading? What do you really want to be working on? Those though, The answer to those questions might not be the same. Um, 
And do you really want to do this? I got advice from an early boss of mine, and I give it to people in publishing when they ask for it. Um, if there's anything else you want to try, try it. Publishing is hard, and it takes a long time to get really good at it. And it takes a long time to not just get good at it, to be, but to be successful at it. And by the time that happens, if this isn't what you really want to be doing, it's not going to feel worth it to you. It would only feel worth it to you if it's really, really like the only thing you want to do. And for me, that was the case. And so the work that I get to do now is very, is very gratifying because this thing that I've worked at for a really long time and have had, you know, some, some semblance of success at, it was really what I wanted. Um, it's also important, I think, to um, to know to draw lines in the sand sometimes, and to know when to do that, um, even if there feels like there's going to be a short-term cost to pay for it. You need to be firm about that for yourself. It's really tough to do the work long-term if you're not. Um, and also to be yourself. And I know that's that's really trite advice, like to be yourself in the work, but it's critical um, because your own perspective, your own experience, your own taste, all of those things you bring to bear in the work. And if you're filtering it too much for an audience that you think can't handle you, you're not gonna make it. It's, it's gonna be a really tough road for you. I really, really, really appreciate that answer. Um what you said at the end about the filter because um something that that stuck with me um that one of our guests said ever since he said it uh dr daniel black shout out to you if you're watching or listening he talked about how with um his latest book black on black how he wrote naked as in he left it all on the page right and, and i remember before we went on air i was like damn you in this book saying all the stuff we ain't supposed to say he said, hey, if I didn't do that, then the ink was wasted, right? And that's something I've thought about ever since he said it. And it's something that I hope I'm brave enough to do consistently, whether it's on here or whether it's when I'm just writing something or whatever. So, yeah, I, that's what I thought of when you said what you said about essentially making yourself palatable for like someone who might not even be paying attention to you for real. Yeah. Yeah. And as an editor, for a writer like the one that you're describing, you want to be an editor who, who can catch what he's throwing and can, to the house, present it exactly as it is and yeah. feel good about it and make the book work so that the, the book has, there's no sting off of it. You're not filtering it on behalf of the writer because you think it's best for him. No, 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 no. How he threw it is how you're throwing it and learning how to make the house listen to the thing just as it is. Work, work. And that takes a lot of experience. That's yeah. fly. Yeah, you, you guys both were just really cooking right there. I'm just I'm just soaking all that in. That was um uh, I was that was really deep. And I was thinking about um something I've been telling folks in general, like that that stuff like for instance when you say you know it kind of sounds a little trite like those things right there are always super important and people don't really believe it and so yeah. you have to give it that disclaimer because you're already aware of that there's just this what well, swarth of people who who don't believe that right like in this value of just being yourself and i don't know if that's because so much of society kind of tells you not to do it uh or just it seems too simple Right, a thing to to believe in, but it is. It's true. It's it's definitely helped me do a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah. In the really end, is. you're still yourself, you know. You're gonna be able to do the work better, comfortable. Yeah. yeah. So you wanna you've gotta figure out how to be yourself. You need to be professional. You know, you can't just come in like you're not at home. So, you know, it's people sometimes mistake. Well, this is what I do other places. You can't do everything that you do at home that you do in a professional workspace. But at the root of it, you are you. And at the root of it, I am me here the same way that I am when I'm other spaces. And I bring that knowledge and that that um, perspective. And, and I think it benefits the work. 
Yeah, I'd hate to give my students more fuel uh, in their quest to replace uh, traditional education with TikTok. But I recently saw on TikTok uh, someone say that uh, you are who you are, where you are. And if who you are is not accepted where you are, it is the where that needs to change. And I was like, yo, that's that was kind of I'm, I'm rocking with that, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really I'm really rocking with that whole thing. So now we'd like you to kind of explain to us uh, in your sage like wisdom, as you've already uh, displayed. I'll try. What, yes. What exactly an executive editor is and what they do. Sure. And perhaps if you could take us through, you know, like some some motions of what a regular normal day or normal week looks like. for you. Sure, sure. So an, an executive editor is has the same responsibilities as any other editor, but somewhat managerial, you know, in some perspectives. And my list is a little bit bigger. And the responsibilities that I have attached to my list, I think, are more robust than a more junior position. Um, an editor's primary responsibilities are to acquire, publish, and... I'm sorry, to acquire, edit, and publish. That's how I think of it. So there are three parts of my job. The first part of my job is to convince authors to publish their work with me and not with you, Akili, or not with you, Reggie, or not with somebody else at another publisher. I'm trying to convince them to pick me and my team. And sometimes I'm able to do that and sometimes I'm not. For the ones who do choose me, then my second part, the second part of my job is to get their manuscripts as good as I can get them as good as I can get them. Um, and you, the way that I think about it is I, trying to get a writer to write at their, their highest capacity. And every writer's capacity is different. And it's really fun when you have a writer, um, and pardon anybody who's heard me talk about this before, because I talk about it a lot, capacity of writers. Um, sometimes a writer has more capacity than you realize, and that's really exciting. Sometimes a writer has less capacity than you realize, and then you got to figure it out. But the goal of that second part of my job is to get the writer to write the very best book that they can write. That's also the book that I signed up. And then the third part of my job is to um, give that manuscript over to my production team and for the book to be packaged really well. So for the cover to look good, for the paper quality to be good. I don't, I'm not the person who takes the point on all of these um, decisions, but I'm sort of the captain of a ship sort of, you know, so to speak. Um, and so I have a lot of input into what those decisions are. I don't have the final decision on some of those things, but what I think goes a long way. Um, the marketing, publicity team, sales team, um, art, design, there are so many people whose expertise and vision comes to bear on the production of a book. And in the publishing process, I'm sort of the, the one that's um, the wind at the house's back and always sort of course correcting if necessary. No, 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 I know we're sort of thinking about the book this, but we need to be thinking about the book this way. I think there's another opportunity here or we're doing really, really great guys. You're sort of cheering the house on. And that's a really, um, that's, that's, that's what that third part of the job, knowing how to publish your books well, that's the law, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the part of the process that takes the longest to learn and to get really, really good at because depending on where you're working, you may be able, to be able to acquire things. And depending on how good you are on the page and how good the author is, you may get, have a really strong manuscript. But a lot of really fantastic books get published every year that none of us hear about. How well are they published? Um, you could be at a really great house. You can have paid a lot of money for your book. And when it comes time to publish it, something else brighter, shinier, more expensive has come along and suddenly everyone's forgot. How do you remind the house that they need to be paying attention here? So publishing well. So acquiring, editing, publishing, that's the fundamental part of my job. That's the fundamental part of any editor's job. If you're a more junior editor, an editorial assistant, an assistant editor, an associate editor, you're trying to do the things that I just outlined, but you're more than likely assisting somebody who is. And that's a really tricky sort of role to play for several years. But once you make editor, then you're building your own list of titles and you know, whether you're acquiring and working on four books a year or 20 books a year, the rudimentary parts of the job don't really change. Mm. What does an average day for me look like? Um, I'm on email a lot. <laughs> I'm in meetings a lot. Um, I'm reading a lot. I was thinking about it a couple of weeks ago. 
I'm probably holding, and I don't think this is unique to me. I think most editors who are like, like rigorous editors are probably holding close to 3,000 pages in their head at any time. And that's not me exaggerating because it's, and I couldn't tell you every word on every page, but like their books, there's a manuscript that I'm editing now, right? I'm deep in that. There's a manuscript I'm going to edit next. And I've read a version of that, but that was like a month ago. So I'm going to read it again, but I know it's there. They're the submissions that I'm reading, right? They're the, I, the book ideas that I have that I'm trying to cultivate. Like, and this is happening all the time. Yeah. And you got to hold it all. And you're constantly prioritizing it all. That might be a submission that I'm just about to offer on. And so I'm thinking about that a little bit differently and maybe more deeply because I'm trying to convince the author to pitch to pick me. So how do I discuss this book with the writer so that they pick me and not, you know, some other fabulous editor someplace else? And so um, I spend a lot of my day on email, in meetings, reading, thinking about books that I want to buy, thinking about, book, about books for writers who've already chosen me. And then for books that have already come out, is there anything that I can be doing on the publishing side to give that book more oxygen, to keep it going, to have to, to help it have a longer tail? Or if the book, you know, isn't exceeding expectations or isn't meeting expectations, is there anything that I can do to give it a burst of oxygen? It's um, it's one of those jobs that you're kind of low-key doing all the time. That's what I was just thinking about. I was literally just thinking about the the gravity of that like holding that in your head thinking about it from our perspective reggie's probably doing the same thing about well, what is the amount of pages that we hold in our head with what we do here with what we do in, in terms of our moderations in different places um and and in general um and just thinking about what that how, did, how are you negotiating that time away from the office right like i had a I'm going to go, I'm going to air, like Reggie says, on the side of uh, rhythm. I had a question I wanted to ask about the difference between working remotely uh, with uh, Beacon and then uh, assumedly working uh, actually in the office. And, and now that seems even more a robust type of question, considering the amount of reading you're doing, then you're not even adding in the emails you're reading and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the, the import of, or the export of words. You are taking in words, but then there's an out, outward move with words as well. So I don't even know if this is a question, but what does that look like for you when you, what, like how, how do you clock out? Like what, how do you clock out and what is the sacrifice uh, of trying to clock out to a, to a job that demands this of you? Go and ahead. I want to even add like, how do you feel about clocking out? Mm. And, no, and, I, I, and, and, and I say that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I, no, I say no. that because it's like, that's so many, like, like books demand so much of our time that when you're not with them, I'll speak for me. Sometimes there's a feeling of guilt, right? And, and I'm curious, what does it feel like for you to clock out? It feels fine. Let me tell you this. <laughs> um, you have to take your weekends back. Mm -hmm. You have to take your evenings back. You need to love on your partner. You need to love on your babies. You need to watch funny shows. You need to drink good wine and good liquor. You need to go for a walk. You need to touch some grass. You need to sleep in. You're not going to... It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. I feel very fine about clocking out. I'm also, I also know when I can't clock out, mm. right? So there's a, there are moments when it doesn't matter how tired I am. It doesn't matter how deserving I am of a break. It doesn't, it just doesn't matter. The work has to get done. The work has to get done. It, that's how I see it. Not everybody will see it that way, but there comes a point where it's like, it has to get done and it has to get done well. You can't just phone it in. You can't just get it done so you can cross it off your to-do list. You've got to get it done, done. And, and, but I know when those moments are and those moments aren't every week, they're not even every month. Um, so, but that's something that I've come to understand that yeah. I am a better editor. I am better at my job on Monday morning when I've had my two days off. Now, does that mean that I'm, I don't think about work? I'm not, 
in a bookstore sort of perusing and like taking pictures of covers because I'm like, oh, that's a good, oh, I like that. Oh, let me just, let me just keep that in mind. Um, doesn't mean that I'm not reading for pleasure. Doesn't mean that I'm not reading The New Yorker. Doesn't mean that I'm not having social time with, you know, publishing friends of mine. No. So it's not that I step away from like my work. I'm an editor as much as I am almost any other thing. It's how I, it's part of how I identify. I don't know that that's healthy, but it's, it's true. Um, but in terms of like on email, responding to writers um, and doing like the hardest part of the work, I feel really fine about stepping away from it. Yeah. Yeah. That I makes me think of something I, something I think I said on the show um, is, you know, in terms of balance, right? The idea that I, I saw this somewhere, but this, there's this idea that people successful people don't have balance so much as they have moments of extreme like work and then moments of extreme not work right so like when you are off or when you're on vacation you are on vacation you might do the things that you like that you were just alluding to uh but then also like when you have those moments where the work must get done you drive forward um and so I, I have been thinking about that a lot uh, and thinking about rest in uh, from Trisha Hershey's uh, book from when we talked uh, with her. And but, yeah, that, I, I appreciate that answer. What you're getting at around balance, Akili, is um, efficiency and prioritizing. Yes, right? yeah. mm -hmm. And with experience, you become more efficient. Right. And also with experience, you know, like this can wait. Like it's important and I'm going to get to it. But. I got this other thing cooking and that's gonna, I can make up the time. Like you, you, you're working a little bit smarter, but and then you also know when you can, when it has to get done now and it needs to be your best work. And you're just going to put on your, you know, your comfort sweater and you're going to pop some popcorn and have some ginger beer. That's what I do. And just bust it out. You know, I, I'm with you. Uh, but it's I'm not like that all the time. Not everything is, a, a four-alarm fire and sometimes it can feel like everything is but everything isn't most things aren't and and i think sometimes the world again tells us that it should be like we should be on fire you know what i mean like to to produce when i when like when you look at successful people's lives it's about efficiency it's about like making the most of their time um and it's just something i've been like checking in on so i mean i I love when a question gives that. I think as a listener, when I listen to a podcast, when it, a question is like, pow, like right in the, right in the kisser, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that because uh, it brings out like these last few minutes of, of stuff that we've been just saying. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Is it on you, Reggie? Oh, it was on you. You were talking about how your question got destroyed. Yeah. 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 No, now I'm going to do a little uh, roulette for okay. Rakia here. All right. So. All right. Look at this. I love this so far. <laughs> Rakia, I have selling tastes good side A or selling tastes good side B. Which title would you like to hear the question behind? I'll go with A. All right. So every episode we have with an author, I like to ask them, what's the most important lesson they've learned about the business of writing? A question whose answers mean the most during an episode like this. And one answer that stuck with me came from David Santos Donaldson when he spoke about how he read books that perform well by publishing standards to help see what he could work on when it came to publishing his book, uh, the debut novel Greenland. And I thought of an inter interesting scenario that I, I imagine like an editor coming across, right? So I imagine for, you know, whatever reason, I'm sure this might not be the case. So a Colleen Hoover type figure, right, is, is on the market. She's a free agent, right? And I know every editor knows the numbers that, that she's doing right now. And let's say, though, that's not your speed for real. Yeah. Those books are not the books you read. That's that's not the books you're into, right? But at the same token, you have a job, and your job, part of your job is to perform. You don't want to acquire books that don't sell. You want to acquire books that sell. 
So I'm wondering how, you know, you and perhaps even editors, you know, negotiate choice when it comes to acquiring something that's like a surefire bet that I may not be into versus always sticking to what I'm into. So I, I'll only speak for myself. Gotcha. I, I acquire what I like. That's it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's the, there's this thing about like, how did you word it? Um, like what my job, my job is to perform. Yeah. So there's what, there's what other people think my job is, right? There's what the company I work for thinks my job is. And then there's what I think my job is, mm. right? Now I'm aware of what other people think my job is. I'm aware of what the company I work for thinks my job is. And that's great because it overlaps a lot with what I think my job is. But the part, the thing that matters is what I think my job is. Um, and if at some point, what I think my job is doesn't align with those other things, then I just won't have this job. But right now it is, so we're gonna, we're gonna rock with it. Um, and for me, it gets back again to do to working and doing the work. And I am trying to publish books as well as I can that do for me what I consider the work, which is, you know, putting books that are out in the uh, into world into the world that people are going to be reading 50 years from now, and you know, introducing new voices um, that I think other people need to hear talking about subjects that mean something to me and the people that I know and where I'm from. That's the work that I'm doing. And I'm fortunate that I work in a place that values those things enough to have me here. But if at some point they don't, my job for my for me doesn't change. I would just move to some place that did value it. Um, so would I love to have a book that sells Colleen Hoover numbers? Hell yeah! Absolutely. Yeah. At one hundred percent. Sign me up. Where he at? Yeah. Let's go. What? What? How much money do you need? Yes. Right. Yes. Oh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't acquire the book at any cost. Yeah. At any personal cost. If it's not doing the work, would I say to one of my colleagues, "Hey, this thing is it here. We probably, as a company, need to be doing it, but I'm not the right person for it." I would do that. Yeah, but what I'm trying to do is it feels very um, I'm very clear on that. I'm very, very clear on that. And so I see submissions all the time and I'm like, this is going to sell for a lot. This is going to sell a lot of copies. A lot of people are going to be into it. Not right for me. Right. I, feel, I feel fine about that. No, I mean, in, in to be honest, right, like I think there's a serious level of integrity behind a decision like that. Because because if you know that, if you, you got this submission right here, you know, hey, look, this is a game changer. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you could, in my mind, you could easily be like, hey, look, the game changer came to me first. I'm changing the game. I think it's, I, I don't know, maybe you disagree? I, I, I think there are fewer game changers than you think. Mm. Like, so the people who have those books that sell forever and ever like usually nobody knew that was going to happen you don't acquire it being like you know what this is going to be a phenomenon yeah the thing that's a phenomenon it's a phenomenon no one saw it coming um yeah that's not always the case but i know that i've been in auctions for books that i lost and my team we put up a ton of money and somebody else put up a ton of money plus another ton so we lost and then two years later, we're like, whatever happened to that book? And we Googled it and we're like, oh, it already came out. We didn't even hear about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah, that company yeah. thought it was going to be a game changer. And so did we. They just thought it more aggressively than we did. Yeah. You know? So it, it's, it's rare to have books that do those kinds of numbers. And when that happens, it's a little bit of a fluke most times. You're happy when it happens. You ride the wave as long as you can, but it's so hard to predict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, yeah, you speak with a with, with a level of certainty, and, and of course, like you said earlier, that kind of comes with um, experience. But 
uh, one thing I love about these interviews are is and what makes them fun is that there's like not necessarily a book to pull my questions from. So it's like, yo, I'm the question guy we're, we're, from whence coming for my help, you know, but, um, you know, thankfully, like you said, there's there's, an, there's a wealth of available information out there about you and your position. Um, and and when I looked up the duties of an executive director on God Jr., which is Google for the uninitiated, um, it said that um, essentially uh, you're, you're responsible for the editorial direction, right, of, uh, and the content procurement, which is, is kind of where you were headed, um, and that he or she works from the vision set by uh, an editorial director to create the tone and editorial direction of the individual publication. Now, hey. Sometimes this is why Google is God Junior. Sometimes you can get a little wrong, right? But when I think about that, I wonder how much you think you are responsible for the tone and editorial direction of 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 your imprint. Um, do you kind of see where I'm going there? I, like I see where you're going, but I'm not a director, so my editorial director that is her job, right? And my that publisher is, that's his job. Okay. I'm the executive editor, so I'm a role player on the team. You know, I'm not Jokic. You're not Jokic, more of uh, I'm like Porter? a Michael Porter Jr. Michael Porter Jr. Know? Okay, I'm wow. Oh, you know, I'm on the start. I'm in the starting five, but I'm not the franchise person. People who know the game will be like, "Yo, that's Michael Porter Jr." But mm -hmm. like, I'm not in no Nike commercials. You know what I mean? Like, it's that's not that's not what it is. So yeah. I am. One of many, many editors here, but I direct nothing besides myself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Which, which, do you got something to say to that, Rich? No, nah, it's interesting because I guess I was, I was under the impression that maybe um, an executive editor might possibly be Michael Malone, mm. as in the coach. Nope. Mm. Nope. So that would be at my publisher. Ah. As, the, as the coach he's directing everything like the way that the entire list looks and how it's how it's run as a as a uh uh the books that we're publishing like the not he has a lot of he empower i feel empowered as an editor and i think my many of my, my editorial colleagues feel the same way but my publisher sort of gives the final green light not sort of he gives the final green light yeah. Um, and then he handles a lot of the business affairs. So that's a, a hugely managerial uh, position. And yeah. then we have an editorial director um, who's, who works mostly on the fiction side, but she is the editorial director here. And she has a lot of the responsibilities that you were describing, Keely. As an yeah. executive editor, I am one of the people that executes the vision that they have. Word, word. What I am very certain about is what my vision for my list is. And I'm very clear about that. I'm clear about that for myself, and maybe that's what you're getting here for me. Mm -hmm. I'm also very clear about it with my colleagues, so that when I, they need to know what it is that I'm up to, yeah. And they and then they figure out how it fits with the larger um, vision for for the imprint. But I have very little input on that. I just do what I do, and they seem to like it, and so that's how we're rocking. But yeah, yeah I'm I am not a director. I'm an executive editor, and that seems to be. Going, going, going so far, so good. You know, we also talk here about the perceived differences between being what we call classically trained in the book world in terms of authors citing the traditional climb through a creative writing slash literary undergrad and the subsequent stay at an MFA program as like a prerequisite that's adjacent to folks who don't do either but find their way to publication. Your climb seems to be the classical model for climbing the ranks in publishing. Yeah. Uh, and I would want to know if you first agree with that, but then also, what do you think are the benefits of having a background like yours when it comes to this climb? Yeah, very, very yes. Um, I started from the bottom as an editorial assistant, actually as an editorial intern, then an editorial assistant and sort of brick by brick. And my ascendancy was quite slow and hard. Um, yeah. And I think this is a good question. I think about it a lot because publishing, we're recruiting from more different kinds of places, which is really, really, really good. Um, I'm in favor of that. I hope that we continue to do more of that. But I only know how to do it the way that I came up. Mm -hmm. You know, 
and it's sort of you can't skip a step and you learn how to get good at it because you kind of at this at the first step you had to master it before you can move on to the next half step and then mm -hmm. you had to master that and then you move on and so what that ended up looking like for me was a very slow ascendancy um, and I think harder than it was for most of the people that I entered the industry with and harder than it should have been. And that's not sour grapes. That's just what I think it was. Um, but the fruit of that bears in how I work now. Um, the problem with that is that it means that you're expecting somebody. Can I curse? Yeah. To eat a lot of shit for a really long time. Mm. And most people can't hold on that long. You know, yeah. most people can't hold on long enough to get the chance to do the work in a meaningful way, at a meaningful wage. And I kind of just figured out how to do it. And that's not integrity. That's not, um, there's no pride in that. It was the only thing I wanted to do. And I was like, I can do this. I was like, I know I can do this. Why can't I figure out, like, why won't anybody let me do it the way that I want to do it? Like really get in there. That's where Beacon Press came, you know, into the picture. But so I, it was the only thing that I wanted to do, and I came up brick by brick by brick and had to master each step before I was allowed to move on in a way that I, I didn't see for all of my peers. Um, but I think anybody that I work with now, whether they're my colleagues here at Mariner, my authors, agents in the agency community, I feel like they're like, she's cooking. And I think that's because going back to the basketball thing, like if you learn like all the fundamentals and you can build and now you can do something, you, you're working at a level that's more efficient, that's smoother and it looks more effortless than it is, but it's because you didn't just try to go for the trick shot. That's it's built on a foundation that's rock solid. And I got, I, my training was exceptional, it was exceptional, but you shouldn't have to have all of that training to do the thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll track it. Yeah. And so, Rakia, would yeah. you like to hear side B or would you like to hear end credits? I want Rakia. side B. Give me side B. What's side B. We listen to the whole album. <laughs> All right. So as as you know, we've been talking about a lot during this conversation. You know, no one reaches what we all like to call success without a team. And, you know, authors, despite their names being the sole name, oftentimes on the front of a book, you know, are no different from anyone else. Um, and, you know, please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but because of you having, you know, the power to acquire books, you may be something like one of the most important teammates that an author has. Um, and what I like about you from what I see from afar is the work that you do on social media because you're always championing, you're, you're always championing your authors. You're, you're sharing pub dates. You're, you're sharing features in publications. You're sharing when they win Kirkus prizes, right? You are always there to say, hey, look, so-and-so is killing right now. Check this out, right? And I wanted you to talk to us about the importance of an editor being a visible champion. And also about just how being a visible champion has helped to strengthen the relationships that you build with the authors that you, whose work you acquire. Uh, good question. I, there are many editors who are much more powerful than me who are not on social media at all or who use their social media to post pictures about their families and their pets and their vacations and their gardening. Um, so I just want to be like, I'm out here trying to drum up as much interest and attention for my writers as possible. But an editor who doesn't do that isn't working less hard. You know, um, sometimes I've had instances where I'm doing that because I'm like, am I the only one who's doing this? 
So, you know, my social media following isn't robust, but it's like, I follow a lot of people in the publishing industry, a lot of people in the media industry. And if I can get somebody to pay attention for a second longer than they were going to pay attention, maybe, you know, if, you know, maybe I can get something to happen. Um, that's not always the case, but I've certainly felt like I need to be loud. Um, I think what you're picking up on, Reggie, is, is my advocacy for my writers. And it is unending. It is deep. It is unending. It's Arthur and I working together. We are in it. We book married. That's how I call it. That's what I call it. We are book married. And where you go, I go. And where I go, you go. And my writer's success is my success. And I only get to call myself successful if that writer is successful. You know, I want them to succeed as much as I want myself to succeed. They're completely tied to each other. Um, and yeah, I'm comfortable on social media around you know, championing my writers in that way. But I, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it feels normal to me, but not but. And I know many other writers, many other editors, or publishing people generally who have way more or who are so who are so facile at the publishing part of the job acquiring editing publishing they are so good they know where all the cheat codes are they have figured the system out that they're in so well that their little tweet is nothing it's a whisper so they're gonna post pictures about their ducks the ducks yeah. in their backyard you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's nothing why tweet when I can rally a sales force of hundreds of people? Like, Rahia, what are you talking about? Mm. That, that's cute. Your tweet is cute. Your Instagram post is real cute. I saw you live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And so it, 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 it's no, a, an editor's visibility on social media looks more powerful than it is. That's not to say that I don't think I have any power in how my books are published. But no one should be fooled by that. Yeah, it's like you you've been to the mountaintop. You've seen the just the, how far power can stretch. And I've talked about uh, we, we when, both mentioned this. Yeah, like when you see power, when you see a powerful <laughs> editor, I think I'm learning in some ways. Like I'm still on the come up. When, there are people who in, who who are working this building who I see every day in the halls. And when I say powerful editors, I mean power and excellent. And their books win prizes every year. And they're on the bestseller list for many, many weeks. Not just one week and then they fall off. They on, they're on the list and they stay on the list. And they yeah. win every auction they're in. Like, and they're not also, they're not tweeting about these things. They're not putting the, Instagram, their page is on private and they have five followers and it's their kids. You know, so it's, it's, the kind of visibility that we see on social media, it says something, but it doesn't always say what you think it says. Yeah. 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 No. And 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 I, I'm glo I'm so glad I asked that question. It just just because that is something we talk about all the time. Like and, and I, I even say like one of my secret end goals is to like leave social media. Like I don't want to be there, but I feel like it's it's a good enough tool, right? Um that's a good word for it. It's a tool, right? Yeah. And so yeah. for me, it's a tool in my very, in my growing arsenal. Yeah. Well, why yeah. would you use a switchblade when you got a, you got a Uzi? It. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> and for some people. There's this what they got. Yeah. Yeah. Instagram yeah. is is a switchblade. And, and to I've be honest, that. That, that power that you speak of, my page would be private too. What? Yeah, I mean, I and I, I, and I even step a step further. There wouldn't be no page. I, I, listen, I've said that. Listen, I've said that tons of times. I, I think one time we were talking about social media, and I was like, I think it was something like three hundred million people on there. I was like, there are eight billion people on this planet. <laughs> so when it sounds like everybody's talking about something, it's not really everybody, right? Now, but then to the other the other side of that coin, like you said, it's a good enough tool. There are people who have who have mastered it. Who utilize it uh, to their ends, but there is, but you should just always keep in mind that there is someone else out there who could uh, do something equal, 
uh, something with equal presence with less work. Um, and and just, you know, like you said, like, that's cute, you know? Uh, yeah, that's, that's I don't like my post. Liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they beat me. They kicked my behind in tomorrow morning's auction. You know what I mean? Damn. Girl, I'll double tap that. Look mm -hmm. at me out here trying. <laughs> I will never forget it, and I think that I think that the, the supreme powers, whoever sits on the top board of white supremacy, got this commercial off the TV. But it was this commercial that came on that I talked for like one week before I couldn't find it anymore. And they were talking about uh, protests, and there was like it was a satirical um, commercial, right? I guess aimed at trying to like drive things uh, like into like a more of an active thing but it was these white folks and they were like um they were getting asked what they thought about like these movements and they were like oh yeah i really love those movements and if the weather's nice maybe you could go to one of those nice little protests that you guys like so much and i remember watching it and i was like because mm -hmm. i was like i know there are people who said that. maybe you can go if the weather's nice tomorrow Maybe you can go to one of those cute little protests that you guys like so much. And I was like, mm. and I remember I showed it to my kids, and they were just like, and I could never find it again. I guess they were like, we we went too far on this one. <laughs> you know? They probably scrubbed that thing. They got that one right. on off there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was wondering because we have had this discussion, how much uh, a, an author's social media presence. Uh, factors into acquiring acquiring and subsequently uh, selling a book, right? Not necessarily selling it in an idea or of getting a deal, but in moving units. And I want to know your thoughts on the importance of uh, social media uh, and or a social personality uh, for an author when it comes to uh, today's climate. It helps, um, but it really depends on what the topic is, right? Mm. So if if an author has social media, but they're not good at it, it's not mm -hmm. helpful at all. Um, or they're not comfortable on it, or they don't like doing it. We just don't, we don't, we don't push it that much. Um, it, also, people can have large social media followings, but they don't have like, but it doesn't always move units. It doesn't always sell books. Um, and then some people can. It's just like they tweet something and then we look at our daily numbers and we're like, oh, wow. Like, that's yeah. really moving copies. Um, I think that, I think publishers overall are more skeptical about social media um, numbers indicating like strength of platform. Mm -hmm. um, for, no, for the first thing, you can kind of game the system in some ways. I don't really know how that works. I just know that it's possible and that sometimes writers do it. And then sometimes you, you're, you're, you're relying on a writer to use their following to do that. Mm -hmm. So, I had one writer uh, has a social media uh, accounts across many platforms, but only wants to use one of them to talk about books and wants to use the others, the other accounts for other things. And I'm like, dude, like help me help you, you know, but that's the decision that, that, that he's made. And so it's just like, you know, it's his book and his name. And if he doesn't want to talk about it, you know, in these other places, only in this one place. Okay. Um, I think it means less than what people think it means. Yeah. I think platform is really important, important though. And platform doesn't always equal social media presence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or number of followers or likes or anything like that. Um, like access to media, having media contacts and having media contacts that are senior. You know, if you know an executive producer for a show, we want to know that you know an executive producer for a show. That's more valuable yeah. depending on the show than a large social media following. Um, yeah. Also, so, like, I like writers who are game. Like, they really they want to do um, good work editorially, but then they want to talk about it. They want to talk about themselves. They want to talk about the work, and that's not always going to be the case. You have some writers who are, you know, very introverted and um, have stage fright, and they just want to do the work and then put it out there for people to talk talk about. They want to engage with the work. They're interested in that part of it, but the public facing part of it sort of makes them a little bit uneasy. Word, word. The platform question is is always a tricky one. You want a writer who has one, but what that looks like can vary. Some writers, it's, you know, on the speaking circuit, that's where the audience is. Yeah. You know, some writers have, um, their career is a very specific thing. 
my uh, publicist, a friend of mine, uh, we were talking earlier today about why hasn't there been a book about realtors? Like, you know how many thousands, I mean, probably millions of people are realtors in this country? Like, if you publish one book, like a juicy book about realtors, and like a tenth of all realtors in the country are read the book, you got something cooking. I don't know that book would be, but that's that that person doesn't have to have a large social media following. There's an audience built in for for what they do. So so platform can can look really different. Yeah, no, that is um that that's important too because um like you're saying platform can be different so hey you may not got you may not even have 10 followers on social media but you got 10,000 people that come to all your speaking engagements so right you know what well, I'm saying you know, your frat your sorority yeah. your alumni yeah. you know connections your church your pickleball team <laughs> yeah yeah whatever it can it can look different and yeah yeah I have a question based on kind of like what you were saying about this, the possibility of this realtor book, right? Um, you know, you, you're you're someone who, you know, is ultimately whether whether you want whether or not you'll call yourself a big player, right? I definitely perceive you to be a big player. I'm gonna call you a big player, right? Thank you. In, in the world of of publishing, and this question, I think is ultimately simple, but I think it has potential for some profundity right and what would you say is hot right now in the world of publishing middle america white lady fiction that's hot that's mm -hmm. always gonna be hot always yeah i was just thinking the same thing yeah yeah that's always gonna be hot but like middle america white lady fiction done well like written well it's gonna be hot um political books are about to, to get hot again because we're going into a presidential election. You know what's hot? The, I just don't get the TikTok books. I might be too old. I just, this could be just, I'm just too old to, to get it. I'm not on TikTok. Sometimes I call it talk Stay tick. Stay don't, away. don't go, don't go. Um, but there are TikTok star, people who are certified stars on TikTok who have book deals. Mm -hmm. And I think some of them are working, but I I think I think it's going to be more missed than hit. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, on the submissions front, I think what consumers haven't seen yet, but what's coming are books that sort of are major reconsiderations of um, Native American communities, seeing those sell. So like, you know, how they were educated land issues i feel like there's a i've been i've been hearing a lot about a lot about those kinds of books selling within the past 18 months or so and i suppose in the next 18 months 12 to 18 months we'll see those books start to come out and i i hope that they do well from younger writers as well and not histories but like personal narratives i think are coming rakia we're gonna we're gonna get to these closes here you know uh, they you know the the original questions was given you were giving answers to them that were too hot you know, we, we don't even know what to do with these. I got this water. I got to get more of it. I you know what I mean? <laughs> um, your biggest literary influence or biggest literary influences, or maybe we could put a unique spin on this, maybe a big editorial influence or biggest editorial influences. I'll answer both. Toni Morrison, obviously. Um, I read right. Song of Solomon when I was 17 and it was a life-changing experience. I mean that quite literally. Um, yeah. I did not know that books were art until I read that book. I thought books were, I was a reader, but I thought books were just, they were fun. And I still think books are fun. Um, and it wasn't like I had never seen myself in books. I had seen myself in books. I read Walter Dean Myers. So a lot of the ways that you talk about that I've heard of people talk about their sort of entrance into the, their love of reading. I just loved reading, you know. Um, but books were not art until I read Song of Solomon. And it it was an earth shattering in the best way experience. And yeah. so that was really pivotal. It remains my favorite novel um, for that reason. What was the second question? I forgot just that. Oh, um, editorial, biggest editorial influence or biggest editorial influences? So my second job in publishing was at Viking Penguin. 
and I was 24 when I started that job and I worked there for almost four years. And the editors that I worked with, I won't name them all by name because I'll leave someone out inevitably and then I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But these were some of the absolute best, most elite people in this industry that I, to the to date I've ever seen. And it was just like, it was the A-team. It was the A-team. And I was so junior that my role was really to support their work. You know, I'm getting coffee and I'm at the coffee machine and I'm making reservations and I'm, I'm on the sidelines. I'm in the, you know, I'm on the bench, like deep on the bench, like second row on the bench. But I, I get to be there. And that was when I knew that, that there was a space for me in the work because I knew that I was smart enough to, 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 to do what they were doing, even if I didn't have the experience or the skill level yet to do it. Seeing it, my proximity to it was really, really important for me at that point. Um, and I'm happy that that happened then. Um, and then all of the skills that I had learned for the first 15, 16, maybe 17 years of my career, I was able to execute the very first book where I thought, where I think I put all of the pieces together was, was Brian Broome's memoir. Like I knew it instantly when I, I when people, like, I knew, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then it was like a two and a half year process of acquisitions, editing, publishing. And that was the first book that I worked on where everything I knew, all the ancestors came. It was like, all of it came to bear and I got to do it on that one book. And I've since been able to do it for others, but I had never put all the pieces together. It was like, I was having a, the perfect game, you know? Yeah. Oh, you know, others, I was like, oh, maybe if I could have, nah, nah. this one, I was like, I've got all the pieces. And that was sort of confirmation of something that was very important to me personally. I love that book. I love Brian, but I would, it, it was confirmation to myself. The thing that I thought I could do, I did it. And that was, that continues to be very moving for me. I love that. I love yeah. that. And yeah. the book or perhaps books you want Akilah and I to read if we haven't read them. Right here. Right here. In the family. So I know y'all know about this one. Mm -hmm. I know oh, yeah. I need it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Get into this. This dude here is doing serious work. Um, Santi Elijah Holly, he's an essayist journalist uh, out of the West Coast. He had a fabulous interview that aired early today on Fresh Air with Tanya Mosley. So check that out. Yeah. It's a fabulous book. Fabulous book. It's sort of it's the it gives you a it's a long overdue look at the Shakur family. It's less about Tupac than you think. His mother Afini was serious. This woman is like a, a superhero mm -hmm. and um Asada and just like the whole collective. It's incredible. This has been out for a couple of weeks. Okay. This one uh, here, American White Lash. I'm gonna keep going until y'all tell me to stop. Uh, <laughs> Wesley Lowry. I only got three, so this is the second of the three. Okay, Wesley okay. Lowry, uh, superstar journalist, won one Pulitzer, been a finalist for another. He's like 12 years old. Like I feel old every time I talk to this man because he's been so he's so accomplished and he's done it at such a young age. Um, and this book is being published in the UK and here in the US uh, in two weeks. And we have quite a robust, very robust publicity and marketing lineup for it. And then lastly. Burn it down. This has been making some noise over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. We found out today it hit the New York Times bestseller list and the uh, Los Angeles Times bestseller list. So we have an instant national bestseller, and it's about abuse and harassment in Hollywood. It's making a lot of noise and sort of, you know, shaking the the ground, a little earthquake in in Hollywood. Yeah. Those are the three that I've got out for the summer. That's my summer list. Really proud of all three. Yeah. Kelly, you are muted. I was just saying that's a very powerful list there. Um, all right. So tell us who you would like to see as a guest on Books of Pop Culture. But if you are connected with this person, then you must disclose your connection so that we may also be connected. So you should get Santi on here. Y'all would like Santi. Y'all would, yeah. would rock with Santi. Yes. Um, who else? Have y'all had you done Israel on yet? We have. It was we, yeah, <laughs> during our Instagram live era. Okay. You've had your yeah, time. but we haven't had him on. We haven't had him 
as a senior editor who has books out in the world yet. So I, I think it might be time to listen. Get them before you can't get them. Is yeah. That yeah. Serious. Yeah. I love you, Don. I would say you, Don Israel, Danny Vasquez, one of my favorites. These are two two editors who are just incredible at what they do and um, work with a lot of integrity and heart and, and skill. I would say Danny and you, Don. Nice. No, thank you for that. And the easiest question of them all, um, you know, I know you, you spoke about a little bit about what's current for you, but maybe um, what's next for you, um, as well as where people can follow your journey, whether that's a website, social media, whatever the case may be. Sure. So uh, I've got four books out this year. I just showed you the three that are out for summer. Yeah. And then in the fall, I've got a book by a journalist named Jean-Jacques Taylor. It's called uh, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders and the Making of Men. Ooh. And this is, uh, uh, Jacques was embedded with um, uh, Deion Sanders for his last season at Jackson State. And so it's about, you know, HBCUs and it's about um, college football culture, but it's really mostly about Deion's, like the, the mind of Deion Sanders. What is it like to be in the room, on the practice field, at the games, in the film room, with the coaches? It's one season following Deion Sanders very, very closely um, and seeing how like his focus on uh, dominance, not just on the field, but off the field, um, his emotional connection to his players, how much he cares about them. It sort of raises that it sort of it raises the bar for what parents and players expect from coaches, how seriously Deion Sanders takes that responsibility and I think gives um, sports fans an idea of what they can expect from him in Colorado. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's out in October. Ah, that's that's fly. Yeah, yeah. Oh think, man. Yeah. Rakia definitely... know how to acquire them books. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying so hard. You know how to acquire them and publish them. You Come know, on so, now. so go. look, y'all <laughs> gotta make sure whether it is Coach Prime, whether it is American White Lash, burn it down. An American family, Ricky, punching up to the gods, white lies, Harry mm -hmm. Sylvester Bird, whatever the title is, <laughs> y'all make sure to get that title from bookshop.org slash shop slash books of pop culture for Rakia Clark, Rakia the Great, and Achilles, Missouri. I'm Reggie Bailey. This has been another edition of Books of Pop Culture. We'll see y'all next time. Take care. Peace.